I will now prove the linear property, or more precisely, linearity with respect to individual columns and rows. For us, it will be more convenient to discuss this property from the point of view of rows, because we chose a row-wise definition of the determinant. But of course, all of our arguments will apply equally well to columns, if for no other reason than the transpose property. OK, as you recall, it is best to break up linearity into two parts. The first part deals with the sum of two vectors, while the second part deals with the product of a vector and a number. The first part states that when a particular row in a matrix is thought of as a sum of two vectors, then the determinant of that matrix equals the sum of two determinants, where in the first one we have the first vector for that row, and all of the remaining rows are the same, and in the second one we have the second vector for that row, and the remaining rows are the same. So the first part of linearity reminds us very much of the common distributive law. Let's consider an example. Direct your attention to this 4x4 matrix and look at its first row. According to part 1 of linearity, this determinant equals the sum of two determinants, where the first row of the first determinant reads 30, 40, 60, 80, and the remaining rows are the same, and the first row in the second determinant reads 1, 1, 1, 1, and the remaining rows are the same. And of course you could have broken up the first row in any other way, or any other row in any way you want, as long as you do it one row at a time. So that's the first part of linearity. The second part of linearity is even more straightforward. I don't even have a graphic for it. It states that when in a matrix you think of a particular row as a number times a vector, then the determinant of that matrix equals that number times the determinant of the matrix with that vector at that row, and the remaining rows are the same. Let's consider an example. Once again, direct your attention to this matrix, and notice that the third row can be represented, or thought of, as 11 times 3, 1, 4, 0. Therefore, this determinant equals 11 times the determinant of the matrix, whose first, second, and fourth rows are the same, and the third row is 3, 1, 4, 0. So there you go, that's the second part of linearity. And let me remind you that the second part of linearity immediately implies the following, that if a matrix has a zero column or row, then its determinant is necessarily zero. Let's first prove that property by using this matrix as an example, the second matrix. You will notice that it does indeed have a zero column, the fourth column. So let's consider what will happen to the determinant when we multiply this fourth column by, pick a number, 7. On the one hand, the matrix will remain unchanged, because this is a column of all zeros, and therefore the determinant will remain unchanged. On the other hand, according to the property we just discussed, the determinant will be multiplied by 7. So the determinant of this matrix is a number that equals 7 times itself. So it must be zero. So a totally straightforward consequence. And now let's concentrate on proving linearity itself. And I will tell you up front that I will mostly dismiss the proof. As fundamental as linearity is, and as much as I'd like to talk about it longer, it's actually completely obvious and follows right away from the definition. And the longer I talk about it, the more complicated it will seem. So I'll try to make it come across as simple as it really is. And here's the gist of it. For the first part, when a row is thought of as a sum of two vectors, let's say it's the second row, then in this grand sum, in each term, the second entry corresponding to the second row will be a sum of two numbers, where the first number comes from the first vector and the second number comes from the second vector from the right entries in those vectors. Therefore, each term in this grand sum can be broken up on this plus. In other words, it can be distributed according to the common distributive law. 
and we'll end up with two sets of sums. And if we group together the n factorial yellow terms and the n factorial reddish terms, then the first group of terms will of course equal this determinant and the second group of terms will equal this determinant. And that right there proves the first part of linearity. The second part of linearity is perhaps even more straightforward. When you think of a row as a number times a vector, let's once again say that it's the second row. Then this entry in each term, this factor in each term, will be that number times the corresponding entry in the vector. And of course you can factor out that number, put it outside the summation, and inside the summation you will have precisely the determinant of the matrix with that vector on its own at that row. So that's all there is to linearity. It's as fundamental as it is straightforward.